Hey everyone, welcome to Artist Decoded episode 169. This is your host Yoshino and this is a really exciting episode. This is with neuroscientist and musician Ryan York interviewed by artist, musician, polymath Justin Dosher Hopkins. This is kind of an experiment, but it's an introduction to an initiative that we've created here at Team Artist Decoded to bring more people from various fields outside of the art world onto the podcast to talk about subjects adjacent and related to the arts, but not necessarily directly influenced by the art world. And I'm interested in finding an overlap, a confluence between various worlds where they mold and how these conversations shape various ideas and even how they contradict each other. I like how Justin and Ryan explore ideas of knowing and not knowing. And this question comes up for me, what do we actually know? Or what ideas fall into short-sighted dogmatic principles? This is an especially fascinating conversation because Ryan has experiences both rooted in the arts from being a musician for many years and how he's able to break down his perspective in a way that is deeply rooted in neurological and scientific understandings, but he's also open to understanding things more abstractly, such as from the vantage point of spirituality or from various things that you can discover within the arts. And he's able to break down these creative principles in a very eloquent way. And I like how he's able to relate that back into neuroscience and biological studies and just science in general. So I found this to be a really humbling conversation. It's jam-packed with information, so I feel that everyone will get a lot out of this episode in particular. But before we begin this episode, I'd like to announce that we're starting a Patreon. It'll have tons of little extra added features such as access to a private Discord group, access to uncut episodes and first releases, also discount codes, and many more. So be on the lookout for that. We're planning to release that within the next few weeks. This next track is from Justin and Ryan's newest music project entitled Nale Mishima. This has never been heard before. We can consider this the, I guess, unofficial premiere of their band. The track is called This Is Fine Part 2 featuring Yvette Holsworth and engineered by Jared Rodriguez. I'm going to give you a minute preview of the five-minute track, followed by the conversation between Ryan York and Justin Dosher Hopkins. Hope you enjoy it, and thanks for tuning in. Okay, so I'm sitting down with uh, my good and old friend Ryan York, and Ryan York is a, what are you? I am a scientist and an artist. Uh, I do mostly music um, in the arts, but also practice visual arts too, Um, and uh, in science, uh, I'm a biologist by training, an evolutionary biologist, Um, but I'm interested more broadly in how brains and behaviors evolve. Hmm. And uh, part of the practice of both of those is figuring out, both the science and the art, is figuring out how they can relate to each other, 
both in terms of the actual practice and the output and conceptually in my head. Um, and that's where my ongoing interests lie. So what projects are we working on right now in regards to uh, um, making a graphic element for all the data points you were talking about? Yeah, so a huge part of my work over the past couple of years uh, has been coming up with computational methods for understanding behavior. So what that means is using a lot of coding and statistical methods to represent what animals do in a easily understandable and visually interpretable framework. So what that actually translates to is recording a ton of data of animals moving around and the animals I work with uh, mostly these days are fruit flies. And so it's basically getting an insane amount of data of them walking around and taking those tracks. So I, from those data, I can get their coordinates or their positions over time and start to get some understandings of the common patterns of their behavior over time and represent that visually in a two-dimensional space. So that is where it starts to kind of get a little bit into the art world because mm -hmm. the representation of that should be both interpretable and I think also appealing to the human eye so that as you actually start to use the representation of the behavior, you know, you're drawn to wanting to look for differences and variation in it and uncover patterns in the data. Mm. And so that's kind of where things have been for the past little bit. So just to make it clear to the audience, and you are a biologist working in an academic field. This is not for like public consumption for like an art project. This is supposed to be something that is useful in the academic realm. Yeah, exactly. So my current position is that I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford in a neurobiology lab. Mm -hmm. So all of this work is supposed to be, it will be published in for scientific uses for other people to pick up and try to apply to their data. But part of what's motivated me for to do this work and the way I'm doing it is that it's, it's kind of a little bit uh, less computationally intensive thing to do. So a, so a really hot thing in, in science broadly right now is to apply a lot of the algorithms from artificial intelligence research and machine learning things like huge fancy neural networks and, and to take those and to apply them to whatever data set you have. And they can give you incredibly predictive and robust answers, but built into those methods is the fact that you don't know what, why they're doing what they're doing. It's kind of a black box. Mm -hmm. And that's actually kind of cool sometimes and, and fine if really all you want to do is just to be able to predict you know, if a pedestrian is walking in front of a car and they're going a certain direction five seconds from now, are they going to be keep going the same direction or not so that the self-driving car you're concerned with is you know, not going to kill them or something like that? Sure. But in my case, the stuff that's in the box there is the stuff I'm actually interested in. So it's like, why, what is it about the animal's behavior at time point X that means that you can actually predict you know, five seconds in the future? What is it about their nervous system or their previous behavioral state that's allowing you to do that prediction? So the stuff I've been working on is motivated by a desire to keep it simple and in a realm of representation, understanding that humans are drawn to. And so that's where the visuals that I've been working on come in. And also to make it so that it's appealing to other researchers to use, so that they can actually, even if they're not very good at coding or don't have a lot of computational experience, can pick it up and throw it at whatever they, they want to look at. So do you think this is more like um, making your information in the biology realm, neuro neurological realm, more accessible to uh, other disciplines so you guys can, as a collective group of researchers help each other more? Is that an accurate assessment of what the end goal of this is? Yeah. You know, the first goal really is just to try to get other people who are studying animal behavior interested in this. But more broadly, yeah, if other scientists could get interested in this type of analysis, that'd be cool. Mm -hmm. But I think also in terms of it becoming public facing, the fact that it looks 
appealing is something that I'm not, you know, ignorant of. And I think it's a kind of interesting place to push this. If it could be ultimately become an art piece or something like that, I would be totally interested in that. Well, I mean, the data, them, like I've seen a lot of these like um, data structures, for lack of a better word, um, that you've done. And they do have this feeling of almost process driven art if outside the outside the context of scientific data and the academic realm that they live in. There definitely f- has this aesthetic appeal to them that feels more like pointillism or minimalism or some kind of almost like emergence generative artwork which essentially it is it's like um mm-hmm. and we've had a lot of off mic conversations about the idea of uh art and science and the overlap and the goals of each and one being a more instantaneous discovery based thing where it's more about the curiosity in in the art world the more this curiosity and question asking and then the science is it can in, it can kind of um inspire scientific investigation that with all its structure of the scientific method kind of come to a an end point that has more functional use throughout all the other fields so maybe like one can kind of inspire the other or something like that and this is kind of an interesting zone where it's you're you're coming from a standpoint of an artist and and a scientist so you kind of understand that middle area a, a lot better than a lot of these a lot of traditional scientists would in, in an interesting part of science, too, that I don't think gets a lot of credit outside of actually the, the science world is the fact that there are a lot of moments of really rapid exploration and insight and creativity and explore, like kind of explosions of ideas that are really similar to artistic creativity. It's just that they then are producing content that exists in a world of constraints. So whatever you come up with has to then be run through this thresher, this gamut of actually being real, you know, actually being useful for science Mm -hmm. and actually showing you something that's reliably true. And that's one of the coolest parts to me of doing science is that there is this extra level of constraint on it. That's that as if, if you see science as an artistic practice, it's this really interesting one where you know you can have whatever ideas you have, but they have to be tested ultimately. It's not mm-hmm. just that you can have the ideas and put them out there, you know. And I guess I guess with art, that's true too, because things get tested, quote unquote, by you know observers, by you know your community, by the world at large. If your ideas actually become influential, maybe that's one form of constraint. You know, there's there's only so many things right now in in art or any given moment that are popular and that are going to hit the zeitgeist in a certain way yeah i mean i don't i don't see much difference aside from that there's like a high level of importance put upon repeatability right so yeah that's like kind of the big thing and in order to be repeatable you need all this vetting and the method behind it to ensure that that's the case or quote unquote true you know do you ever think about that with your art practice this idea of repeatability like uh for sure but also the idea of repeatability is something i try to avoid it's like uh, i like the curiosity element that exists in both the scientific realm and the artistic realm but the thing i like about the artistic element is that it's it it's almost it needn't go further than the question you know, the Mm -hmm. hypothesis and then look, this is a possible outcome. And then that possible outcome is almost created to spur iterations based off that. Like in, in the context of like a creator to a viewer relationship, it's like that viewer takes it and Mm -hmm. the unspoken agreement is that they interpret what they will. And then that iterates in some capacity in this unknown world in their, in their own brain. Right. So it's, um, it's, it's similar, but drastically different in that sense like the idea of it being ultra repeatable to me personally is not that interesting it's as soon as it happens i already want to explore a different angle of it because now i've i've seen that side of it or what i think is that side of it and then i'm it's more interesting to find a different angle of it and then you kind of create this density cloud of knowing uh, all the space around an object so that you can understand the object yeah if that makes sense kind of a strange way of putting it but i feel like Science functions in the same way, but almost as like a more group think thing and the personal and 
individual aspect of just asking the question and not being so concerned with the answer and then moving on and and kind of developing whatever this shape is over the course of your career is more interesting than knowing every step of the way if that is if that makes sense at all yeah uh, but there is this idea in art that i've always liked too that it, through your practice as an individual you know you're going to be asking different questions each time maybe in different media but you know in many ways you're still repeating what you bring to the table in totally. each time and so that's where this weird form of repeatability might come in that mm -hmm. you know you're going to be consciously or unconsciously constrained by whatever you're actually interested in and the biases you bring into the practice and your certain skill set too mm -hmm. so you know you, your your conscious experience of it as as the artist is yeah of course every time trying to ask a new question explore a new thing but it's becoming a different iteration of who you are you For know sure. and and it's going to be just kind of a, a new representation of that. And I think that's true for scientists too. You know, what you choose to study is similar and that evolves over time, but you bring your specific focus and your specific background and experiences to it. And, and you know, I think while I was saying earlier, science does differ because of there being constraints, it's not nearly as objective as I think people tend to think of it as being. There's different flavors of answer that will come out of research depending on who's doing it and depending mm -hmm. on how it's funded and the lineage it's coming from. And those different types of answers may be quote unquote true. They can be repeatable, but you know, they might have edge cases where they're not true and that will differ depending on, you know, who's doing it. Mm -hmm. And so that's also kind of a cool aspect of it too, is that the more that you practice science, and that's actually been one of the parts of it that I've enjoyed the most as I've gotten further into it, is coming to realize the contours of our knowledge and, and the creation of knowledge and the, the limits of that and how amorphous but also solid that can be at times mm -hmm. and how, I don't know, it's, it's almost made me more interested in non-scientific understandings of the world, you know, more spiritual or religious understandings that hold actually a lot more space for there being an unknown, for there being an uncanny, you mm -hmm. know, like a sublime way of understanding the world. Because I think science, there's, there is a lot of stuff in science that at, at, its, at its core that is true and repeatable and always going to be the same answer. You know, the periodic table is, is pretty much the periodic table that's very unlikely to, to change. Mm -hmm. But when you start to get into the realm of biology and these kind of quote unquote messier areas of science, um, it becomes clear as you start practicing it that, that every answer we give is kind of provisional. It's like, mm -hmm. this is like a good enough understanding of what's actually going on in this messy system. Sure. But you're always kind of flirting with the unknown in that sense. And you're almost deluding yourself if you think that you've really solved anything. Yeah. Once and for all. When I was young, I wanted to be a biologist or a physicist because I do think there's something very similar to, at least the root of it is this like kind of curiosity about how things change over time, which is, I mean, okay. Also, just to be totally transparent, the whole um, like thrust of this conversation for me is to level the playing field and show that there's more similarities and differences in the science and art worlds. And what you were talking about as far as being an evolutionary biologist and these kind of things shaping over time is and re being repeatable in a way that you take those things and learn from them, which is just essentially what learning is, is evolving what you do based on experiences in this kind of sequential way. But that's, um, I mean, that's really interesting, the idea of the idea evolving and thus the idea evolving you and then you change and then the viewer changes and then you're constantly shifting this context of what that means. But again, it's like on more of a personal, it would it'd appear from the outside that it's a more, the artistic endeavor is more of a, of a personal growth versus like this much larger like macro perspective that you're looking at it. Although it's weird to say macro perspective when you're, um, you know, tracking the movement of fruit flies and things like that so that's a, that's an interesting yeah. question actually is why yeah. fruit flies why that of all things like why track that and why is that your case study for this theory that you have yeah it's kind of historical accident fruit mm -hmm. flies have been you know studied by scientists for over a century now 
there's a insane amount known about their biology, about how their genomes work, how their brains work. And a couple of years ago when I finished grad school and I was looking for the next thing to do, it was kind of a easy choice to move into it because fruit flies have quote unquote tools available for them, scientific tools that are just unparalleled compared to other animals. And I really wanted to be working with a system in which I could actually potentially get at some fundamental questions in stuff I care about, which is evolution and behavior. Mm. And they offered the chance to do that. And I've really come to appreciate them as an animal because, I mean, we all have experience with the fruit flies in our houses and nobody likes them very much when they're around. But having spent pretty much every day with them for a couple of years now, you know, it's, it's hard to miss the fact that they're pretty sophisticated little animals who court each other and, you know, males sing songs to the females to uh, try to try to have sex with them. You know, they have aggression. They have they have these these full kind of social lives that we miss unless we're looking at them underneath the mic- microscope. Hmm. But, yeah, so, I mean, it, it was mostly that the community has been continuing to grow around them for you know decades now. And, and so that was the thing that pulled me to it. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And so another thing you uh, mentioned briefly before is the idea of unknowable things like these different modalities of understanding, whether that be spiritual or things like that. And I think we are reaching this time in history where the idea of a lot of these scientific endeavors are more like like popified in this weird way. There's like an under, a general like layman's understanding of neurological elements and things like neural pathways and things like that, that are kind of uh, mainstream interesting and how that almost opens up this whole unknowability of the human brain. And then of course, like the virtual reality and reality. And then that whole space has this feeling of mysticism in that same way that like, I forgot who said it, but it's like a very famous saying about science at some point being like unmistakable from magic because it's so beyond the realm of thinking in this weird way that it's, you can't differentiate the two. And I think we're closely approaching that, that space where this massive, like almost like, I don't want to say um, collective unconscious, but some kind of massive globalization of knowledge and understanding that is the internet and that whole reality is very similar to how people in Buddhism and all these ancient religions kind of, not ancient, but practicing now, like old religions have uh, kind of seen themselves interconnected and there's this mass feeling of consciousness and all that stuff is almost, there's more of a direct correlation now in technology. And that almost seems like there's much more of an overlap of science and spirituality and art now than there ever was before. You seem like one of those guys who's very open to discuss all those things um, mm. in these different modalities. Yeah, I don't think that'd be a bad thing if that no. continued to happen to you, especially if more scientists got on board with that. Because, you know, in, in specifically in the world of neuroscience these days, we're starting to develop, I mean, technologies exist now that allow us to potentially record the activity of every single neuron in a, in a brain. And, and you actually can do this already in quote-unquote, simpler brains. So in fruit flies, nematodes, uh, some fish, you know, there's, there's some technologies that exist where you can actually look at the whole brain doing stuff all at once, and then you can relate that to what the animal's doing. And so you start to get at this extremely tight relationship between the brain activity and what the animal's doing. Mm-hmm. And the minute you have that, it starts to bring up really, you know, kind of difficult questions about free will and what it means to be so rooted in our biology. Mm-hmm. The, that kind of dirty word of like determinism starts to kind of seep into how people think about it. And there's definitely a lot of neuroscientists out there who think that by being able to do this now, by be able, being able to watch a brain in real time and then come up with algorithms to understand how the neurons relate to each other and ultimately produce minds and behavior that we will have solved maybe existence that that you know we will know maybe what the soul is or something like that Mm. there's a lot of i think optimism out there for that and i and i it's that's a really interesting area to me because i think 
In one sense, sure, that's true. You know, I think if you can reduce a system down to its parts and explain why it, why X thing happens when it does a certain sequence of, of events, then sure, you understand it. But does that actually mean anything in terms of our daily experience of having brains? Like, I, I kind of don't think so. I don't think it necessarily has to matter a lot that we can do that. And, and on top of that, too, even if we can explain things perfectly, if we can record every neuron and be able to explain perfectly why certain things are happening, it takes a lot of hubris to assume that, you know, we've actually gotten at the deep fundamental reason why things work the, the way they work. Like, like, I think that's, there's like an argument for humility there always. And I think that's where making more room for a spiritual practice or maybe kind of even like a magical understanding of the world uh, is a little bit useful in this sense. It's not, it's not that it has to replace scientific practice, but anything that can keep people in the mindset that we know so little, mm -hmm. always. And our models of the world are always going to be imperfect. Like that's, I think, a healthy place yeah. to be. It's just uncomfortable. But Yeah, I mean, yeah. I would argue that the spiritual component of this whole understanding is not only a, at least a little bit useful, but it can be monumentally useful just in, in a, and I'm not, and this is going to come off kind of outside the context of this conversation, a little bit uh, condescending, but if anybody knows my personal life, they wouldn't think so. But even in the idea of like what placebo means, like the idea of putting your play yourself in this position to allow the, your, and essentially in this context, your body to heal itself in some kind of capacity, whatever that means. People just take that for granted. And that is like an almost, to me anyway, maybe not to you, but like an almost like unbelievable thing to process, like to even understand what that means. Like people say, like, oh, it's placebo, it's nothing. It's like, no, it is actually something. It's definitely something of a tremendous value. And if you just extrapolate that out, like the spiritual realm and all of that stuff to, to give someone that kind of feeling of, of hope and an empowerment and community. Cause the mind is powerful. The mind is the mind powerful. It affects so much of what goes on in your body and the physiology. Mind, yeah. yeah. Mind affects your reality and, and thusly affects the reality of your community. And that is, if that isn't what a lot of people consider magic, then I don't know what, what is like, that is a really powerful tool. So that's like, maybe the language is different, but I think, in a lot of ways they're after a similar thing. So, and it also seems that the more you approach an answer, the, the more, the further away it becomes and in the sense that the more you realize, and it's kind of this kind of trite adage, but the more, you know, the more you understand, you don't know, the more you realize you don't know. So is that something that you run into in the scientific realm? Do you have like that kind of friction when you're studying stuff? Do you feel that everything is at some point going to be knowable? in any in the lifespan of the human race do you think that's quantifiably possible you start to get into philosophy of science stuff there that that's that's interesting yeah. though that's at some point that's what that's what happens all these things kind of bleed into each other cuz i just don't know what knowable means right ultimately nobody does yeah that, right. and and i think people people think they know mm. but i think it's dangerous to come down on too hard on one side or the other of that or at it's, least i'm not it's above my pay grade in a way Seems like uh, super problematic to, because then that's where dogma comes into play. It's yeah. like you, like this is it essentially it comes down to, oh, because the human mind is limited. Like a lot of these, you're under restrictions of science and stuff is limited to uh, only knowing so much in, in a sense. Uh, um, so you have to, it's almost instinctive to force a path for yourself or like, you go down the path and what a path is is a clear way versus the the treacherous way. So yeah. So by taking that path, you inherently disregard a different path. And there's different levels of understanding too. So yeah. something I think I've I've been thinking about relatively frequently for the past year and a half or so is the fact that so my one of my mentors in grad school had a massive stroke a year and a half ago that starved one half of his brain, so one hemisphere of his brain of blood for six or seven minutes. And it led to pretty widespread tissue damage. And it is the one of the most striking examples of how so much of what we are is our brains. 
that I've ever seen. Because, and it's it, the crazy thing too is that he's a neuroscientist. So as he's recovered mm-hmm. from this, you know, he can consciously tell you with the correct terminology and understanding and everything what's going on with him. And one of the things that he displays is hemispheric neglect. So if if a part of your if one or the other side of your visual processing areas in your brain dies in a specific part, you can have this crazy experience where you're not blind, you're still seeing out of both eyes, but you're not seeing with like a capital S in the sense of actually recognizing objects. And so when, you know, I'd visit him in the hospital and he'd be eating dinner, he would only have eaten half of the food on his plate from only the side from the intact part of his brain looking at it. And then the other side would be fine. And you'd have to actually turn the plate around for him so that he would see Mm. the rest of the food and eat it. And he would make comments like, man, this hemispheric neglect is a bitch. It's just wild because we know exactly why that's happened. It's because this very specific part of his brain basically just died. And so that is, a. I mean, I think that's a level of understanding that, okay, well, you know, when you see things and recognize them, there's some part of your brain that's required to do that. And we know that part of the brain, we know what it does and how, how it does what it does. And so that's pretty deep level of understanding in some ways, but it's still just one level of mm-hmm. it, you know, of it's course. like, it's like hyper adaptive. I mean, like the brain in itself. So I also wonder, do you think him having this uh, extreme knowledge and that specific area may in a weird way potentially limit the way he can restructure his brain in in a way oh that's an interesting question like neuroplasticity let's say like the dogmatism of or the uh ideology of the scientific method understanding what that is and so you are you can only think of the things that have already been studied and you're you're already like creating pathways in that way to understand it so because he can he can understand and spe- vocalize it in these scientific ways, is he blocking himself up from the possible unknowable aspect of this thing? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't think a ton is... We need to know more about how plastic the brain is. Mm-hmm. There are clearly cases in which it can be very much so. But in terms of thoughts actually guiding the plasticity in important ways... And the jury is kind of out on how yeah. much that actually can function. But maybe it's the case that him being a neuroscientist predisposes him to be more motivated to do the typical course of therapy or something right. like that, to follow what the doctors are telling him. Right. And by doing those practices over and over again, it, it puts him down a, a specific route or something. Right. And, and I yeah. mean, I'm just thinking again, like the whole placebo thing, it's like a cert- that ignorance in a weird way is power. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know, that's just interesting. I don't know what that means. It's just, again, that unknowable thing that's yeah, that's the most interesting thing. Placebos are almost like art in that sense, too. Big time. Yeah. Hugely. Yeah, Hugely. you're doing something to alter someone's way yeah. of experiencing or thinking mm-hmm. about the world for a tangible outcome. Yeah, like you, I always thought of it as like some kind of a psychic portal you open up. Like you mm. have ju- you have something that's just recognizable enough for them to attach themselves to or project onto and then again the unknowable aspect of like the mystery of it which is in any really interesting piece of artwork there's like that thing that you can't quite grasp there's the shape of something that is not quite understandable and then that's conjures interest which like again sprouts off like in this like fractal way like different conversations and thought processes and things like that again not different from the science world may be just a more like accessible route, I guess. But um, one thing I want to talk about before we end our conversation as well is like we know each other from years back through the whole music thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ryan and I have played music together. We have recently in the last year and a half or so reconnected and have this really bizarre musical chemistry that's uh, it's like kind of transcendence of of just like almost like human relationships too, because there was a, a a long time where I hadn't seen or talked to Ryan for a long time. And then we met up and we had this kind of musical connection that kind of shaped and formed and all these things. So where do you see like scientific relationship in your music? Do you, does that change how you understand music, see music, how you uh, understand the process of it? Or is that, uh, do you feel like that's like a, a disconnected thing that allows you to, 
function in a different way uh, aside from science. Yeah, there's there's a lot of different ways that they intersect. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the practice of making music, which is basically organizing events in time. Mm -hmm. That I did music first before I got into science, and I, I I especially made a lot of recorded music first before really getting into science. And and recording music is coming up with kind of a rational system of organizing events in time. And that thought process is actually really similar to different areas of biology, understanding how neurons are active over time or understanding how sequences of the genome vary over time and how they relate to each other. So at that really bare basic level, they've always kind of coexisted or like they've, I think one has given me ways to understand the other and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But then on, on more kind of broader abstract or metaphorical levels, they also intersect. And this is stuff that we've talked a lot about too with this project is the idea of having, you know, approaching music from this, this mindset that you almost have like an algorithm that then produces some emergent outcome. So you, mm -hmm. you come at it with like some kind of practice and, you know, through that, maybe you put some constraints on yourself. And then if you get lucky, some kind of uncanny or almost surprising, unknowable thing comes out of that. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think that's been part of what's been really interesting about this, this current project we've been working on, because everything for the, for the listener, um, so much of what we've been working on for the past year and a half came from a couple of sessions of just Justin and I improvising together and basically creating a sound library um, and also bringing some friends in to play play with us and pretty much everything we've produced and it's now what three or four albums worth of yeah music potentially <laughs> yeah is is pretty much just rooted in those sounds alone there's no samples outside of that there's no you know synthesizers or anything and that's been really interesting too because it's it's this kind of like rich soil that stuff grew out of emergently mm -hmm. and so there's there's kind of cool like scientific metaphors that I think, you know, it's been useful to think about there for me too. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, even the, like I always, uh, with this project in particular, it's kind of a, a mix of like slow and fast composition, like and primal, almost like purely instinct driven. I feel like subconscious mind speaking as a layman, subconscious mind versus like the analytical brain. So it's like we have the this impulsive uh, instinct to create and in the moment, you know, feel the, the vibration, the temperature of our interaction and then play off each other. And then from there we step outside the like instinct and like kind of analyze the whole thing, rearrange it. And that's where the algorithmic stuff comes into play for me because it's like, um, like your brain and my brain kind of have these like parallel trajectories. And then we kind of just bounce these things back and forth. And then as a result, because the technology we have now we can manufacture almost like limitless amounts of stuff mm -hmm. and it all came from like this interesting purely primal thing and then as analytical as this process is the end result is weirdly enough sounding primal again yeah if you were to tell people that like this was like oh this was chopped up and like uh, very specifically like quantized or like set in the sequence and structure and densities it it, I, I feel like they would scratch their head a little bit because um, it sounds so vibrant and alive still, which is kind of the trick of the thing. But um, I don't know. It's been an interesting process for me. And just seeing like that, how it mirrors itself through those same kind of relationships happening in the natural world and the artistic world and all those things. More, like a lot of these philosophies are more similar than they are different. And I think uh, there's been a lot of dogmatism to separate the you know the spiritual artistic and and scientific sides but they're all coming from the same place so yeah so it's all really interesting to me the exact words for that or in this relationship i'm sure will be constructed soon but i for me it's just is like this weird feeling of this oneness across all all these different modalities of thought that is just really interesting yeah yeah and the different scales of things too is a really intriguing idea this idea that you'd mentioned earlier of slow versus fast composition or maybe even slow versus fast understanding or mm -hmm. experience of things that you that i mean this project is is true in that sense that it's it's marrying this like immediate 
improvised, very primal, very emotive experience with this much longer term kind of like tortured compositional process. You know, and that's true for science. That's true for painting. You know, you can have very gestural in the moment emotive strokes, but you could also have a piece that you're finishing for two or three years or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and in film, you could come up with clear parallels too. You know, I think it's just kind of human creativity, which is ultimately a exploration of what the world is it's an exploration of um being in the world and figuring out what the fuck that means and yeah i think that that's that to me has always been the through line in all of this it's just trying to make sense of who we are where we're going absolutely and you know there's this uh, strange thing that's been happening for the last decade or so as information and 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 kind of consumerism has like accelerated at this unbelievable rate that now everything is kind of circled around um, speed in the sense of like, oh, I need to consume this amount in this amount of time. This is, I'm ha- like hacking my life to, there's people who sleep every three hours for a, like, you know, half an hour in order to accelerate the amount of productivity we can get done. And it's all about like maximizing productivity. And in a lot of ways, that's, I feel like it's dangerous to think that way because there's this kind of slow craft that's existed in, human development for generations and generations and generations of this kind of slow building system to create the structure in which these small bursts of energy can exist upon, right? Like, like for instance, the idea of like a painting practice, a specific kind of painting practice, but is about like the slow understanding of the medium and how to manipulate it in this way that can be used for these quick bursts of energy. So it's almost like what we're doing is the opposite thing. Like we're going pure impulse and then and then creating structure after the fact. Yeah, but we both bring decades of musical exactly. experience to that in the moment gesture. Yeah. And so it's this weird back and forth, like piggybacking yeah. almost. Like, yeah. So that's yeah. that's 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 that slow work, right? Yeah. So it's um yeah, I don't know. That's just an interesting thing again. Not not no answers there, just like an interesting thing. Like or what people consider the zone and how how can you enter a same zone with multiple people? Like mm-hmm. that's another weird relationship, neural relationship, I feel like, where my brain and your brain fundamentally different, completely different um upbringings and backgrounds, yet there is some kind of chemical thing that can happen where we can function as a single unit somehow without talking about it or anything like that like it's a you could uh say that's almost some kind of psychic connection some yeah. kind of spiritual connection but but i think it's just because we're both fans of this heat <laughs> <laughs> but our music doesn't sound like this heat. <laughs> so like what the fuck is what's that about yeah. or talk talk or any of these R- things right. we claim to try to emulate um yeah. i know it's weird i mean i guess that's like the 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 theme of this conversation is like i don't know it's weird things are weird <laughs> Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to know as much as you'd like to know, but the pursuit of it is is a rich endeavor. But um, any other things you'd like, and anything else you'd like to leave the listener with before we conclude this interview? Keep exploring stuff. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Being right. alive is crazy, man. <laughs> Being alive is crazy, man. Uh, well, Ryan is a, a brilliant scientist and musician and artist and. And you will be seeing collaborations with uh, him and I in the coming weeks and months and years. And uh, stay tuned for that. Thanks for listening. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. Editing assistance is by Noah Wainwright and intern is Sam King.